Hello. All right, I think we're live. Cool. Hey, well, thanks everybody for joining us for this uh, History Chats this afternoon. Um, uh, my name is Ben, and I'm going to be talking about my favorite picture in just a little while. Uh, if you're joining us live, it'll be about four or five minutes. We're going to start at 12.30, as always. Um, but if you are watching this after the fact, you know, the recording afterwards, you can just kind of skip ahead because, you know, no need to sit through um, all of this if you just want to get to the, the history. Um, yeah. Okay, just double checking to make sure everything is working. Looks like it is. Hope you are all having a wonderful afternoon so far, or a wonderful day, I guess. It's not uh, kind of recently afternoon here. Cool. people are here. Um, I guess, as always, I should should probably uh, take the opportunity here while we're waiting to, to say thanks to our, our sponsors. Um, Naki Bookstore has been sponsoring History Chats this year. Um, so big thanks to them for making it possible for us to do this, as well as to um, all of our, our members, of course, here at the Marathon County Historical Society. Um, if you're not already a member and you're you know, interested in, in these sort of things in the history and want to support local history here. Um, it's a great way to start if you're not already. So um, if you if you wanted to uh, get in touch with us about uh, becoming a sponsor or uh, if you're if you're so inclined or to, um, uh, yeah, uh, become a member, um, a lot of great stuff that comes from being a member, not just the satisfaction. Uh, I'm giving you here the, the, the pledge drive pitch here, but, um, you know, it's it's something if you're if you're interested in, in wanting to support um, historical society, uh, yeah, um, our website marathoncountyhistory.org, um, or we are now open. So if you're in the area and you want to stop by and see some of our exhibits and say hello in person, you can do that too. Okay. see here. I think also while we're waiting here, let me just switch something out real quick. Yeah, so while we're waiting, I can also let you know, oh, that's didn't size it. Here we go. Um, so we haven't been quite as active about promoting this as we should be, but, um, this weekend on Saturday, we're going to be having a history, uh, speaks, uh, we're back to doing some of these, um, and we're going to be having a presentation from Rick Lohr, uh, about his experience and time in Poland, um, and use that as sort of a, a way to talk about the history of, of some of the interesting things there and the, and the things you can get, uh, from the, the, uh, you know, some of these, these historic cities, uh, that go back way, way further than some of our, our history, uh, our cities here. So uh, that'd be a, a great, great presentation. Um, just talked to Rick this morning about making sure everything is, is all set up. So um, that's again, Saturday, uh, just in two days at two o'clock. Um, same place you're watching this, you can tune in for that. All right, so it is 1230. So I am going to um, get started. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, today uh, we're going to continue our theme of the uh, favorite pictures as a, as a framing device for talking about some local history. Uh, last week we talked about um, these four on the right as part of um, some of the staff favorites here at Marathon County Historical Society at the museum. Um, but today we're going to be talking about my favorite picture, um, which is this one. Oh, hold on. This one. Here we go. Um, 
And I should say, before we get into it, um, if you have any questions, comments at any point, feel free to throw those in the comments. Um, we'll have some time for that later. I always forget to do that when I'm when I'm presenting. Um, but yeah, feel free. You don't have to wait until the end. Um, I, I won't be actively looking at the chat, but um, feel free to do that. Um, but anyway, yeah, my favorite picture. Um, this is a, a picture of the 1932 Wisconsin Valley Fair. Uh, so this is at Marathon Park. I think it's a little off the midway. This would not have been at the grandstand. You know, this isn't like the, the main event uh, sort of thing. Um, but at the time, in the 30s, um, you know, if you wanted entertainment, you, you, you had some music playing and you, you bring in local groups like the two that are pictured here. The Edgar Community Band in the back in the, the sort of formal band marching uniforms. And then in these uh, capes and skirts, uh, the Ladies Saxophone Band, um, which I think would have had some Edgar ladies in here, but mostly from Wassa by this point. Um, yeah, it's a great picture. I came across it um, back in 2019. I did a program um, on the history of the concert band scene here in Wassa. Um, it was originally going to be a much larger program, but you know, it's, it's <laughs> you had to cut some stuff, and, and ultimately there was a more cohesive story here in Wassa. But I came across this image, and I was like, oh, this is a really cool one. Um, and I, I, you know, just as an image, it's really good. But I was also kind of struck by, I did some research, you know, it, it, I was thinking at the time I was starting to colorize images a little bit here and there. And I thought, you know, this would be a great one to come back to. I was a little intimidated at, the, at first. It's a lot of people. Um, it's a lot of faces, a lot of stuff to colorize. But eventually I did go back and I colorized it. Because, you know, the accounts of the Lady Saxophone Band are these you know, red capes and skirts. They originally had hats or chapeaus, I think they called them. Um, white blouses, um, and then, you know, the, the Edgar Community Band had these uh, distinctive gold and blue uniforms. Um, and yeah, it, 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 I gotta say, um, you know, this is an early colorizing for me. I, I feel like looking at this, there's some stuff that I could do better if I went back and, and redid it. But um, the real trick I found to doing a really cool colorization to get a really good end product is start with a great image to start with, and that is this. Um, so yeah. I'm not going to get too deep here into the colorization process. Um, that might be kind of a fun um, history chat set for the future, kind of walk you through how you do this. But um, today, I, I just want to take this image and use it as sort of, as we've been doing, um, to kind of talk about the, the stuff, you know, how did this come to be? How did these two groups end up sitting down for this photo in 1932? Because um, it's an interesting story that speaks to the music history, not only here, but in general that, that you may not think about. I don't always think about, and I, I play in community groups uh, like this uh, to this day. We're gonna start with the Edgar Community Band. Okay, so the Edgar Community Band. Um, so I should say, this is one picture of that we have. We actually have a couple versions of it. There's also this one, which is, is nice. It has the, in 1932, they got the date right. They're at the county fair. Um, what they didn't get, well, it's it's also, I decided not to colorize this version. It's There's a little more damage and stuff. Um, but yeah, there's also this image, which comes in the book, The Illustrated History of Edgar, Wisconsin, in 1998. It was put out, and if you fl flip through, it has a lot of cool stuff about Edgar community, including this picture, reproduction of this picture, um, with actually some, some names. Um, it also has elsewhere, not, not in the text here, but on another page, a little of the history. Um, and so using that, we can go, okay, know some of the people here. Um, they didn't know anybody from the Lady Saxophone Band. Um, they just said, oh, they're from Wassa, um, which, yeah, could be. There's also some other people that they don't know. Um, you know, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to be too, too um, well, understandable, I guess. But like, for example, the front row here, they gave, there's seven men um, sitting here and they gave five, uh, uh, five names, the first and last were unknown. So it's like, I don't know which of these four are these three people, but you know, it's close enough. It's, it's a nice, um, it's a nice image. Um, and having some names is great, even if there are some gaps, you know, over this guy, this guy, um, this guy, but you know, having some of them. Um, the one in particular I want to focus on though, is this one here. This is AC Wagner or Arthur Wagner. Um, so the story goes, again, in the history book, the Edgar history book, they give a little bit of an account where they say, uh, back in 1925, um, they, um, there's a guy in, in Edgar, a, a printer by the name of Frank Guion, G-U-I-A-N. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce it. 
And he um, went around and said, hey, we should have a little community band. We should get an Edgar Village band. And so it took about two years, um, you know, going around trying to get people to, you know, are you going to, they, they went to Mr. Wagner and they said, hey, uh, do you, do you want to be part of the group? Um, and, and it's a, it's a good person to go to, right? He, this is, this is Arthur Wagner when he was um, uh, with his daughter around 1906 um, and another group um, that he managed, you know, he's one, probably the most talented musician at the time in the Edgar area, very, very talented professional musician. Um, and he had groups that he put together like this. Um, there were others in the area, of course. Um, so they said, hey, it'd be great, you know, having somebody, uh, you know, to kind of hold down the band with his stature. And he said, yeah, no thanks. Um, initially. Later, he would he would kind of say, okay. But he said, like, I don't want to be in charge. Um, you know, it's one thing to put a group together of, you know, five, six people. It's another to do a full on, you know, yeah, that's a little bit, little bit more than he wants to do. Um, but, you know, he says, hey, you know, get on your feet, do some concerts. If you can get it going without me, you know, we'll see how good you are. And if you're good enough, then it, maybe it's worth my time. And that's not like a vanity thing. It's it's just like, you know, it's got to be fun for him. And he doesn't want to have to be with a bunch of students, you know, um, in order to do that. Later, interestingly, he, he would be in charge of a bunch of students, though. Um, this is him with the Edgar High School Band when that gets formed in, I think, the 30s is when that gets up and running. Uh, but he ends up becoming the, the long-term uh, figure there. Um, so, interesting. But yes, after about four months of getting started in 1927, uh, they, he, he does join as the this principal cornetist or, or trumpeter, solo trumpeter, first trumpeter, um, which is helpful. You have to, it's, it's helpful to have somebody who can just you know, play solidly and, and, you know, can trust it to play solos and, and melodies and stuff like that. So great addition to the group. Um, so, but he's not interested in running it. So who did they get to run it? Well, this guy over here, um, his name is Clive Sterling Cohn or C.S. Cohn. Um, and it's an interesting decision. Um, so Guion, Lambert, some of the other people in the area, they, they, they're, you know, trying to get somebody to come in. And Cohn is somebody who they know can get the job done. Uh, back in 1898, uh, after about being about in Wassa for about two years, uh, he's Wassa based. Um, he comes to Wassa in 1896. About 1898, Spanish American War kicks off. Uh, the United States jumps full force into it, and everybody volunteers, including Cone. And it turns out we need somebody to run a new <clears throat> regimental band. And so he becomes he he jumps in and creates the fourth regimental band of the Wisconsin Volunteers for the Wisconsin National Guard. And so they go down, they play a couple concerts. They, they, they're they basically, I'm not going to get too deep into Cone. Um, I actually did a whole video about him uh, last year. Um, it's, a, it's a good one if you're interested in, in the story. He's got a lot of depth, a lot of cool stuff that, to talk about with him. But just very briefly, you know, he, he gets to start with a military band here. They go down to Alabama. Uh, they play a couple concerts. They march in a parade or two. And they come home. Um, it's a staging ground for the invasion of the Caribbean, the, the Spanish holdings, and just aren't necessary. They don't need to be involved. So they go home. Uh, they're mustered out of the service, but he keeps the band around and he keeps the uniforms and, and the name, uh, which is interesting because he's not in the military. And yet he keeps the name 4th Regimental Band, which I think is important to note because this is a guy who understands the moment and what's popular. He understands optics and, and how to present a brand. At this point in time, military bands are really popular. These sort of concert bands that are playing outside, uh, they're doing marching, you know, for in parades, but they're also playing concerts. And this is incredibly popular. And having a military sort of history here, he's playing on the fact, hey, I'm a veteran, you know, I'm, and, and you know, not cynically, it's just like people people want to support that. And, and he's a local hero for having fought. And as time goes on, you know, the, this, oops, becomes less and less useful. Um, by the 1920s, um, he's not running a band. Um, he's got other stuff. Uh, he is also um, the head of the proprietor of the, it basically runs the Grand Opera House in Wassa for many years um, until that go, runs its course. But he's bringing in acts, um, you know, first film projector. So he's bringing in films that people are going to want to see, knows how to promote it. But in the late 20s, by this point, the Grand Opera House is replaced by the Grand Theater. He's not involved in that. His band, you know, the, the 4th Regimental Band and the orchestra, which is the version of this that plays inside without, you know, the uniforms and the suits and stuff. Um, you know, they're not active anymore. 
but he finds a new career in groups like the Edgar Community Band. Because in the 1920s, it becomes really popular for, for communities to want a band. They want community bands like this. And I should say the kind of definition of a community band, what sets this apart from, you know, Cohn's group before, is this is a group that was supported by the Village of Edgar. The Village of Edgar would kind of help promote this and, and, and even pay for some public concerts. People would come out. In, in Wassa at, at, at Marathon Park, we had the 128th Infantry Band that would do concerts, um, thanks to the city of Wassa kind of helping that out. And that would, you know, there'd be hundreds, if not thousands of people would come out for these concerts. It was really, really popular. And because of the popularity of the format, communities like Edgar and many others in the, in the area, they wanted their own bands, both adult bands like this and also school bands. And the challenge here is that you, you need to have, like today, if I wanted to put together, you know, a, a band in Edgar, right? We wanted a community band. There's enough people in there that we could get something up and running. Um, I don't think there is. I'd, I'd be really surprised if there is. There shouldn't be. But if there was, you know, we could, we could, there's enough musicians in the area that could join. You know, you could have, uh, you know, go to the Edgar High School and borrow music and instruments. And, you know, there's, there's enough resources around. In the 20s, not so much. And so by asking C.S. Cohn to come over, um, they also got um, Seth Damon to help out too, uh, Damon Music. So he had lines on instruments, Cohn had you know, music library, and as well as all of this experience as leading a group. Um, a great example of this is this gentleman here. Uh, if you can see him, uh, this this player, tuba player. I don't know if you can see my cursor, actually. Okay, well, I guess this isn't very helpful for him to do this. Um, thankfully, I have a cutout here. So um, uh, this guy here. So you'll notice the, the uniform he's wearing is a little different. And when I was originally colorizing this, I didn't know what color that the, the uniforms of the Edgar Community Band. I found later accounts confirming it. But originally I looked at that and went, oh, wait a minute, that's the same as the uniforms that he wore here. And these are the uniforms that are based off the military in the Spanish-American War, which were blue. And so from there, it just became kind of a natural progression. And I'm sure what happened here is that the concert was coming up they recognized, oh, we don't have enough tuba players. We could use some help in the, in the low brass. Uh, maybe Cone knew somebody in town. He was a music teacher, so maybe he was teaching this guy and, and said, hey, I got a gig for you. Um, show up at Marathon Park, bring your tuba, wear this. And he pulled out an old uniform. It's close enough. It's blue. It'll work. Um, and he sat in with the group. You know, that's something that, you know, Cohn had connections. He knew students, he knew other musicians, he could kind of facilitate that, and he could throw together a uniform in, in short term if he needed to. Um, speaking of which, just to kind of give you an idea of the investment in a band that you needed to do, uh, Wassa High School, this is 1923. Uh, by this point, uh, uh, Cohn's contemporary B.F. Schultz is kind of helping them out, but this is the orchestra. Um, and it is an orchestra, that it's not a band necessarily, call it an orchestra, which is kind of a band that was indoors. It's, it's more about the venue, the context, as opposed to what music they're playing or what instruments there are at this point. But yeah, this was all extracurricular. That's the way that schools kind of felt about, in America, felt about music. Um, you know, maybe there was a student, uh, a couple students that knew how to play an instrument. They would bring their instruments to the stage on Wednesdays after school for about an hour, and they'd put something together. Sometimes there was a staff, you know, a teacher that would kind of help them out. And sometimes, no, they were on their own. Um, but in 1924, in the following year, they decide, the school district decides to invest in a band. And that led to this. This is a lot more people. It's a lot more instruments. <clears throat> Particularly investing in a band meant buying these bigger instruments, you know. Um, it's one thing to expect, yeah, you, you're learning to play the violin or the trombone. You can bring that in. It's a lot harder to go ask, you know, hey, Jimmy, go go home and get your parents to buy you a sousaphone. Um, yeah. So there's that. There's also music libraries. Um, the following year, they get uniforms. That's kind of helpful. Again, this is the kind of thing they're trying to do. It's, it's a spectacle. They're marching in public. They're taking part in contests. Um, this was a big source of pride. It's kind of like football, right? You got uniforms. You're, you're very proud of your football team going to state. Well, there were events like competitions that your band and having a band was big plus. Um, and then, of course, all of the other things about music being good for education and, you know, the development of students. Um, they also hired KRN Grill to be the instructor full-time on the right there, um, far right. I keep using my cursor. You can't see that. Anyway, um, 
Yeah, it's a big investment. So again, going back, um, Cohn is not just doing this. Um, he gets asked because of his expertise, because of his connections, he gets to ask all of these places. He's in over in Marshfield for a juvenile band, way up in Tomahawk. He's in Merrill for a season. I think he, like, as an intermediate director of the Merrill City Band, uh, he helps the Wittenberg group get off the ground down in Lisbon. Um, I'm not sure what the context is there, but apparently he had a group. And he's not the only one. Um, M.G. Hamill puts him to shame. Uh, Hamill, um, he's originally from Arpen. Um, that's where his family lived. I don't know if originally, but that's where he was living during this time. And he, he ended up taking over the Edgar Community Band about two years after that picture was taken, um, about 1934, 35. Um, when Cohn decided he wasn't interested in continuing to be the guy in charge. He's all over the place. Um, B.F. Schultz, um, uh, again, contemporary Wassa-based uh, musician, uh, head of the 128th Infantry Band, and before that, the Columbia Band in Wassa. Um, he is particularly helpful in getting school bands started. Like, again, in Wassa, he's kind of mentoring them. Uh, he gets hired in Mosinee, Marathon City, and Stratford. I, I'm pretty sure all of those... Um, at least at some capacity to help their band programs as well. Um, yeah. Uh, this is this is um, uh, Schultz's band, the Columbia Band, originally when it's on the Columbia Hall stage. Um, I, I wanted to point this out. You know, take a look at this 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 band and the instrumentation. And there's something that's missing from this this stage. Um, you see it here. You also see it in a later version. This is 1914. The thing that's missing is there's no saxophones. Uh, Schultz, I wouldn't call him a conservative in terms of his musical style. He's, he's, he'll throw some new stuff into the, the repertoire, but in terms of, he liked a traditional German style military band. Um, whereas other groups were moving towards maybe a French or a British style, Americans kind of started to involve saxophones, but the Germans, not a big proponent of the saxophone. And so it takes a while for him to, to you know, see the light and, and throw some in. Um, but yeah, the, the Ed Community Band, it's got some saxophones. Um, as well as, you know, all the other instruments that you, that you need for a modern, uh, at that time, contemporary concert band. Um, so a little bit about the saxophone. It was developed by a guy named Adolf Sax, which is where the name comes from. Actually, he liked to name his horns, uh, his innovations. He's a very talented instrument maker uh, and inventor. These are all, you know, instruments that he he created. Um, many of them have the name sax in it somehow. Um, but anyway, um, he develops this instrument specifically in the 1840s, um, and he goes to the French military, and he says, hey, um, the, the French military at that time, uh, we're sort of renowned for having some of the biggest military bands in the world um, and, and some of the oldest and best bands. Um, and they would invest in having like 70, 80, uh, 80 musicians. Um, that's a big, and, and this is like a single band. They had multiple military bands. Um, these are big ensembles. Um, at some point they had to cut it down to like 27 and still that's kind of like a, you know, respectable sizing band. But he sees this and he says, you know what the problem is? It's the balance. You know, um, the military bands at this point are putting, con you know, it's not just, you know, marching along with the soldiers from campaign to campaign. They're, they're putting on concerts in open air venues, you know, in parks and, you know, whatever. And when you're playing outside, brass instruments will carry. <clears throat> not super well, not as well as inside, of course, but brass, the, the sound quality, there's the sort of directionality. You can point your bell and it'll just go right at, at whoever you're pointing at it. A clarinet just kind of diffuses the sound. It doesn't have the ability to have that same volume. So for the bands, you have to have, it's the same reason like if you go to a, like an orchestra concert today, um, you'll see a lot of chairs of violins, but then there'll be like two trombones, two clarinets, because it's a balance. Um, you, the violins, um, they, they just don't have the ability to play as loudly. So you have to have a more of them to kind of balance that out. Same thing was happening here. And he said, you know what? My instrument, this line of saxophones, these families that I, make, I made, um, these are, it's got a brass body. It's got a big mouthpiece. It's a reed instrument. It's got keys. So it's got a woodwind instrument. You can still do <clears throat> the sort of lines, the versatility that you can do with the, the, the woodwind, the oboes and your, your bassoons and clarinets. Um, but you can play a lot louder. And so then you don't have to hire so many musicians on staff. Um, it's a long story. I'm not going to get too deep into the saxophone. Uh, the saxophone is a fascinating history, but you know, 
let's get let's not get too too stuck in there. Um, eventually, it does get adopted by the French military, and then from there the British and the French bring it to Mexico, and the Mexicans bring it up to you know, Texas and California, and that's how the Americans hear about the saxophone. And eventually, it becomes a very you know a, a stable thing, especially after the patents were out in Europe. Um, in the 1880s and 90s, American instrument makers get their hands on this instrument and they start going, oh, we can really do something with this. We can make it more consistent and mass produce them just in time for the development of, um, you know, community and, and school bands all over the country. Um, eight, um, C.S. Cohn is not afraid to use the saxophone. This is before 1910. I'm not sure how early, but it's it's not too 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 late into the 20th century, and he's already got some saxophones. In fact, his orchestra here, this is from 1901, and it is the very first instance I can find documented of a saxophone being performed uh, by a local person. Um, that's Ralph um, Buchner? I'm blanking on his name. Ralph, uh, he's a cigar maker by day, and by night, he's playing the saxophone for C.S. Cohn. Um, so yeah, he's 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 not afraid to do that. And I will say even even Barney Schultz, even the, these more conservative or I should say traditional uh, uh, band leaders, you know, once he gets a military band during World War One, um, uh, technically Mr. Dana's in charge on the right here, but um, uh, this is this is B.F. Schultz, and he's going to be in charge once. Oh, I, I keep keep pointing with my cursor. The far right um, and the bottom right. Um, the guy just to his left. That is B.F. Um, uh, Schultz, and he's going to take over the band when Dana uh, passes away in early 1919. Um, and yeah, he's going to have saxophones because the military has saxophones. And so uh, when, once this happens over the course of the rest of his career, he's, he's happy to have them as part of the group. And many groups have them. Again, for the same reason that the French go, oh, this makes sense. You know, these public concerts... Um, that they're putting out. A community bands are being formed for a community to put on. It's a public good to play concerts for the public. Having some saxophones is really helpful because it, for a lot of reasons. Uh, you have the balance thing. You don't need as many flutes and clarinets and oboes. You can have some saxophones. It also is kind of modern. This is kind of this new exciting thing. So having that sound is kind of nice. Um, there's also something to be said about in the, the A's of learning to play the saxophone. Um, compared to, and, and I'm not going to say it's like easy, like yeah, anybody can do it. Um, it still puts a lot of work to get into it. But what, what I will say is that the saxophone is designed in a way that actually makes it a little bit easier than some woodwind instruments. Um, the, the big bore mouthpiece that lets you put a lot more air and get a lot more sound, it also happens to be a little bit more relaxed on your embouchure, how your 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 muscles that to, you have to have to, to get make the reed vibrate, you know, compared to a clarinet, um, it's a little bit more relaxed. Um, and especially like double reeded instruments, like an oboe, like it's a lot easier to get a decent sound off of it. Um, it's also the keys, um, are put in place where it's an octave system instead of a register system. So the, the thumb key on a saxophone is an octave key. Whereas the thumb key on a clarinet is a register key, which means that like, so, so if I have three fingers on my left hand, one on my right, on a clarinet, that's a B, and then I put the register key, the back, and it becomes an F. The saxophone, this is just an F, and then that's an F. It's the same. It's the same thing. It, it so it's one. It basically um, simplifies the number of fingerings that you have to learn in order to to play the notes. So for these reasons, it's actually a pretty good learning instrument, and it's very popular with kids. Um, again, it's this new thing um, to the point where like. Adults are concerned about this menace to society, the saxophone. It doesn't sound very, like, and it's understandable, right? The saxophone doesn't have years of people perfecting it yet. It's this new instrument. So if most people are hearing it in the hands of middle schoolers and high schoolers learning to play it for the first time, like, it doesn't matter what instrument it is. That's not going to leave you with a great impression. Um, so, but yeah, people were like, oh, the saxophone, the kids just, like, calm down. It's, it's not even that great of an instrument. Um, but it is because it allows it, it finds a place in all of these groups. You know, um, this is H.G. Hamill uh, or M.G. Hamill, um, the guy who is all over the place. Uh, he has a 4-H band. And, and you can see there's there's a lot of saxophones. And I use this picture also because there's also some ladies playing saxophones, which is also very important to the story. Right. Um, so before the schools start teaching music in, in the schools, before there's a band program that you can learn to play an instrument. If you were a girl, you could learn to play an instrument. You can learn to play the trombone or the trumpet or violin. You could take a lesson with C.S. Cohn or B.F. Schultz or one of these guys, and you could you can learn to play. But there weren't a lot of venues for playing it in public. 
um, the what ex what places did exist for women to perform in public, at least at least you know in polite society, so to speak. Um, you know, there would be instruments that you'd expect to play. Like it would not be appropriate for a young lady to be playing trombone or a tuba or a baritone. Like brass instruments, that's a men's instrument. That's masculine. You could play a violin. You could play piano or sing, of course, if you've got a good voice. Maybe in some cases you could play the flute. But that's kind of it. The school system teaching music breaks that down in a real way. Um, girls can play whatever they want, and they can take part in concerts by playing in, in this ensemble. They can march in, in, in parades, too. And so there is this breakdown. But there remains this sort of holdover. I mean, to this day, if you if you look at your, your average high school or middle school band, and you look at the flute section, there's probably going to be more girls than boys. Um, there's just this thing that we carry over and in certain instruments, there's an implicit sort of, you know, it's, it's not like you have to do this or you have to do this. But there's this, this, this stereotypical gendered role for instruments. It's, 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 there's a whole field attached to this. But one of the things that happens is because the saxophone is emerging around the same time that women are asserting themselves and girls are having the opportunity to learn in school, it's kind of a gender neutral instrument. Um, which is one of the reasons that I think that C.S. Cohn, who not only is in charge of the, um, the Edgar's uh, community band, he also, in 1928, has this idea for a ladies' saxophone band. Again, C.S. Cohn understands the music world. He understands the popularity of the saxophone and its potential. It also, by the way, helps that the saxophones are, you know, there's a family of them, right? So if I play the alto, I started playing on the alto saxophone, um, it's not too much of a a, you know, a problem for me to pick up a tenor or a baritone saxophone, like different pitches, I can play different kinds of parts. They're also pitched in such a way that it's really easy to arrange for them because they're either an E flat or B flat. So, you know, makes it kind of easy for that too. So it's really easy to put a group together. And so he sees that and he also understands that, you know, 1928 in, in Wausau and in Unity in 1924, four years earlier, band programs were started. Around this time, you know, Mosini, um, Colby, uh, I can't remember the specifics, but like by 1930, there's a handful of bands in the community. And by the you know mid-1930s, there's going to be pretty much every high school is going to have a band program. And so he recognizes that these girls want maybe, you know, especially as they're not, you know, now it's more and more common for, for young ladies to remain single for a couple years, you know, maybe do some working in, you know, it's acceptable for them to be a stenographer or a secretary at a company, a clerk at a, at a shop. Um, you know, you can do that. So he thought, hey, there seems to be sort of a confluence here. Why not put the two together? And so he, he in 1928, at the end of the year, he puts out the call, starts reaching out to, to people in Edgar, in Wassa and Mosini, asking, hey, I want to put together a saxophone band for ladies. Anyone interested? And so he gets enough responses in Wassa and Edgar to go ahead. Uh, Mosini doesn't pan out. Um, I think they want like 50 musicians for each of them. Um, that doesn't pan out. They have maybe maybe about 20 in Wassa originally and maybe about 12 or so in Edgar. But it's enough to get started. And so in 1929, um, they have their debut um, and this is this is the advertisement for this. They did this in 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 conjunction with like a play um, that he he knew somebody in. Uh, but it's interesting, right? Um, can they play? You be the judge. And and there's some ambiguousness to the can they play there. Um, it's there's an implied question: Can they play? They've only been playing since December first, nineteen twenty eight. But you be the judge. But there's also that aspect of like, can they play? Um, and apparently they can play because they end up going and they tour across the Northwoods. They, they play in different venues all over the place. Um, they end up um, actually being recorded for the radio um, and broadcast over the radio a few times. Um, in 1930, and this is interesting, they become kind of a community band. Um, just like Wassa is setting aside, the city of Wassa is setting aside music for summer concerts free public open air concerts, you know, come on down to the band shell to put a show on. Anybody that wants to come can hear. Um, most of that money goes, of course, to the 128th Infantry Band under B.F. Schultz, because they're the big guys in town. But they actually sponsor some concerts for the ladies' saxophone band. And so in 1930, they opened the season at Hammond Park. Um, now, eventually, a couple year, within a couple years, the Depression hits, and we need to make some cuts, and Ultimately, you know, if you have to choose between having a band like 
the 128th or the ladies saxophone band, yeah, they lose their funding. And there's sort of a down downhill thing. But um, one of the long-term groups that support them is actually the Liederkranz, the German Men's Singing Club. Um, so I, that's interesting. They play with them uh, until the mid-30s. Uh, but eventually by the end, there's also an aspect here where the, the, the lady saxophone band is made up of, you know, young, unmarried single women who want to go go play um, music in the public. Um, and, you know, while there's an understanding that they can do that, eventually, you know, there's this expectation that you will at some point get married and have children, and many of them do. And it's a lot less acceptable for a mother who maybe has children at home to go off and, you know, tour the Northwoods playing a saxophone. Like, yeah. So there's an aging out process, and without sort of the, the same recruitment, the excitement that had initially, you know, created the group, it just sort of falls apart. Um, there's a similar thing actually that happens in Edgar. Um, Edgar Community Band plays, again, um, Hamill takes over um, in the uh, 34, and then by the end of the 30s, they also kind of uh, stop performing. Um, but yeah. Anyway, um, it looks like it's one o'clock. Wow, that wasn't the 20 minutes I expected. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed it. You, you don't mind the, the extra time. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's something I, I really enjoyed this image. I really enjoyed the stories around it. Um, and, and hopefully you, you enjoyed the, the program. Um, before, before I go too away, um, too far away, I, I should say, um, so we're continuing next week with the same kind of concept we've, we've done, uh, now we've got five. So it leaves this one and Gary Gisselman is going to be back and he's going to be talking about two of his favorite images, um, next week at 1230. Um, so come on back for that. And then also for the following week, um, we're going to be featuring your favorite images. So if you have a favorite image um, of a you know historic image here in Marathon County's history, uh, feel free to comment on this video or um, you know send us. Uh, we also have a post on Facebook or some of our social media stuff, um, so you can comment with the image or a link to the image if it's already out there. Uh, or you can feel free to to email me directly um, at bclark at marathoncountyhistory.org. Um, so yeah, so we can get those in. Um, you know, before the week of, of the 22nd, um, and we'll, we'll put some together and, and just kind of see what, what people enjoy. It's a, it'd be a fun time. Um, and then to round up the month, we're going to have a special guest, uh, Bob Becker, come in and talk about his favorite images. So, uh, yeah. All right. So with that, um, oh, and then, of course, don't don't forget um, uh, Rick Lore this Saturday um, at, um, uh, at 2 o'clock uh, for Impressions of Poland. Okay. So I'm going to check to see if there's any any comments. Um, again, I, I know this went a little late, uh, but I appreciate um, doing this. Let's see here. Okay. So it looks like so Scott asked um, if the band members owned their own instruments. Um, again, it kind of depends. Um, it depends on sort of what context. Usually, smaller instruments. You know, if you've got a, a, a trumpet or a, um, a, a clarinet or something like that, yeah, generally you'd be expected to, to. And they were they were pretty affordable actually by this point. Again, the instrument makers were pumping them out, making lots of them. Um, there's a whole secondhand market you could rent. Um, so yeah, there there were there were people that were um, uh, you know bringing their own instruments. But again, it, it gets into the territory of like you know, tubas and, and uh, timpani sets and, you know, percussion equipment and stuff like that. That's a little bit more cumbersome and, and harder to expect somebody to just bring from home. Um, so that's typically where we see, you know, um, uh, uh, like, for example, um, the Merrill City Band I was playing last night up in Merrill. Um, you know, they have some instruments. They also, you know, might occasionally borrow from, you know, Merrill High School or something like that. Um, as, as a way to, to do that. Uh, but also other, other community, like the percussion equipment typically is, you know, with the band and travels around unless you need something specific. Um, but yeah, that's, a, that's another thing there. Um, let's see anything else here. Oh, uh, Bonnie, uh, had mentioned she plays in a community band. Um, nice. Yeah. I don't know where, where you're from here, but yes, they are definitely, um, the community band is still very much active. Like I said, I played last night in our, our season opener in Merrill. Uh, tonight I'll be in Wausau. Um, 
seven o'clock at Marathon Park if you're if you're looking for uh, something to do this this evening. Um, yeah, for the Wasa City Band, there's one in Mozani. There's they're, they're all over the place. Uh, maybe not quite as quite as extensive as they were back in the day in the 20s and 30s, but uh, still, yeah, still very much alive and well and a, and a, and a fun time um, for both. I, hopefully, uh, the, the the audience as well as as the musicians on stage. So uh, yeah, cool. Well, thanks everybody for for tuning in and um, joining me. Um, oh, Iowa City. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so a little harder to get to 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 see you in person, but awesome that they're, they're you're still doing it out there. Cool. All right. Well, I think we'll call it there. Um, again, thanks thanks so much for coming out and 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 watching live, or if you're watching this after the fact, thanks for for sticking it with us. Um, I hope you enjoyed, and uh, we'll see you next time for some, some more history. Um...